All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining and for making it here despite the HTML push. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Gazem. He's a research scientist at CMU with, um, uh, sorry, research associate with at CMU with um, pretty uh, Ravan Kumar, and he got his PhD in computer science at the University of Chicago. Um, he's going to be speaking today about his paper, Learning Linear Causal Representations from Interventions Under General Nonlinear Mixing, which is a mouthful of a title, but it was one of my favorite causal representation learning papers from last year, um, because it gives a really practical algorithm that requires relatively few interventions, as long as you can stomach the linear Gaussian latent assumption. Um, and we can get to that in a, <laughs> in a bit. Uh, but before we get there, Johnny Shi, who you'll recognize from the end of last year, he gave a, a really nice kind of the first talk of the series, um, is going to give some background on how this works to connects to what we've seen before. So he's going to give us a, a discussant uh, for a couple of minutes, and then and then we'll switch over to Garten. Uh, so Johnny, feel free to share your screen and let's get started. Mm -hmm. Okay. You guys can see that well? Okay, great, All right. Well, I'll try not to take up too much of your time. Um, <laughs> so in this reading group, we've looked at learning high level representations from largely unstructured data like images. And so far we've done this by trying to do inference by inverting latent generative models and discussing the problem of identifiability, which looks for either constraints on the model or requirements on uh, data collection that ensures uh, that our inference problem is relatively well posed. Um, and today we'll continue to look at what I think is the dominant framework in causal representation learning, which is to take advantage of data coming from different interventional settings. Uh, in week two, we heard about how interventional data combined with a polynomial generator function can leave a geometric signature on the data that helps us identify Z. Uh, the paper discussed in week three extends the applicability of this polynomial generator uh, function simultaneously using interventional data for causal reasoning, in particular using theory from interventional causal discovery to derive conditions under which a latent causal DAG can be recovered. Uh, and all that brings us to today's talk, uh, which continues in this direction of studying uh, conditions under which we can perform causal reasoning in the latent space, this time using a linear Gaussian latent structural causal model, uh, but still using interventional data. And it's a really nice way to follow up our previous talk because it sort of aims at the same thing. It looks at not only identification of latent variables, but also uh, for the latent causal DAG. It actually goes a little bit further because because we have this um, uh, linear Gaussian structure, we sort of actually identify the latent SCM altogether. Um, it's a really nice way to follow up our previous talk because I think it comes to rather similar conclusions uh, using what seem like completely different modeling constraints. Uh, and in this case, identifiability is sort of achieved by uh, trading off flexibility and latent space, assuming a latent uh, or Gaussian latent for flexibility in the generator. Uh, and in particular, this sheds the polynomial assumption, which can be unrealistic for, for lots of data. Um, I also really like the interpretation of the contrastive learning objective, which learns to classify samples between different interventions, uh, which I think everyone will find very natural, just aside from theoretical guarantees uh, to learn representations that can, that can carry some sort of causal information. Uh, and I'm also saying this because uh, I tried to implement this method while I was an intern with, with Jason on, on some bio data. Uh, but of course, we ran into problems with how to test causal representation learning on a real world on, on real world data, but that's a problem for another time. Um, just before handing it off, I just want to mention that so even though the assumptions here seem different seem different to the previous talk. Uh, the requirement of these single node interventions covering all latent nodes sort of shows up again, I think. And in addition to current work by uh, Julius von Kugel again and collaborators um, that I think also sort of comes to similar conclusions, it really does seem like these results uh, specifically on like the number and the types of interventions that we need for causal representation learning uh, will be fundamentals uh, to the field of causal representation learning. So. Uh, I'm excited to uh, hear what um, 
what Gutam has uh, for us today. Okay. With that, I will shut up now and stop sharing. Uh, should I start? Yeah, go for it. Okay, great. Uh, yep. Yeah, let me just share my screen. Um, yeah, okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And uh, yeah, it's it's nice to be able to share like some recent uh, results on like causal representation learning. Um, and this is like joint work with uh, Simone Buchholz at MPI, uh, Ilan Rosenfeld at CMU, Brian Aragam at U Chicago, Bernard Scholkopf at MPI, and uh, Pradeep Abhikumar at CMU. Okay, so yeah, thank uh, thanks to Joini for uh, for the very nice like you know uh, connection to like you know uh, this kinds of like work that people here care about. Um, so my motivation was a bit different, uh, as I'll explain uh, in a bit, but um, I'm excited that you know there's a lot of different kind of branches uh, to take this research into. Okay, so basically, like uh, the setup, you know, just mostly for the sake of notation, is that you have, uh, you know, observed data which is which we call as x, you know, x x one, x two, x three, and like some number of uh, of variables that you observe, and we assume that they are generated as per like this latent variable model where you have this underlying causal graph, like uh, which are latent like z one to z four here, which are latent variables, and uh, you have some unknown nonlinear uh, mapping uh, that goes from the z to x. And this is like the the model we we start with. This is the traditional model that you know people study in this work, uh, in these kinds of works. Um, so the idea to keep in mind uh, is that you know x is like some complicated things that we observe. For example, images of like you know some 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 objects, and uh, the z's contain like the the true generative factors, which are like maybe like hopefully like orientation or size of the object that it's, it's, it's being like you know are represented. And one assumption that you know we want to make here is that z is kind of like nice and simple. Uh, in some sense, if Z itself is really complicated, then there's a lot of like you know headache to to figure it out. So we kind of assume that it's simple uh, linear Gaussian. I'll explain all this in a second. And the goal of this uh, you know cost representation learning uh, is to identify this nonlinear mixing F as well as like uh, the the cost of graph Z. Okay, so by the way, feel free to stop me anytime uh, if you, if you have any uh, questions. Um, okay, so this is the goal, and uh, why do we want to do this? Okay, one reason is. You know, because we really want to learn the ground truth. You know, because you know, we are scientists and we want to know what happens, like you know, in different kinds of mechanisms in nature. Uh, the other reason that that I, I kind of you know also like is that if we can do this, we can somehow for some images we can actually learn this kind of causal factors. Then hopefully, uh, it will lead to like you know generalization and like robustness and reliability and other kinds of you know desired guarantees. So that's like a different reason why uh, causal representation learning is very promising, and. For people who know, like causal disentanglement is a special case where uh, the Z is uh, considered to be independent. So it's like in some sense the causal graph is basically empty. So this is like this is kind of like works on ICA and things like that. Okay, so what's kind of like the quick summary of uh, this 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 line of work? I mean, there's a lot to like you know uh you know state here. Uh, but basically, like you know, if you make no assumptions at all, is this not possible? Because you know Z and F can be arbitrarily complicated, and uh, basically you know. Doesn't mean we should give up. No, but what people do is like they make assumptions that are reasonable, and then try to use see if they can use those kind of assumptions to figure out whether we can actually do this kind of learning. So some of these work through parametric assumptions. Some of them are semi-semi supervised. For example, like you have an extra additional uh, variable that you observe along with just the data, like some sort of like you know pre-classified uh, data sets. Um, and then like there have been some works, uh, including my own, like uh, where we make functional assumptions, which are like. Okay, like the function f is not anything, but you know it's kind of like piecewise linear or like you know it's just like conformal things like that. Uh, and then like some recent line of uh, work uh, is like on interventional datasets. So in some sense, we don't have just like one dataset, but we have a bunch of additional datasets that are that are given to us, and uh, we assume that these datasets come from interventions on the original uh, latent variable model. So this is like there's a lot of line of works on this kind of uh, uh, you know like setting. Uh, I guess people, some of the people in the in the audience also have like written papers on this, and uh, you know there are different kinds of flavors of this problem where you assume you have paired data or like you know the intervention targets and so on. So this is like what's what's going on in this field right now, and we pick up the thread on this uh, interventional setting. Okay, what do I mean by that? Uh, we are basically given a bunch. We, we remember the model x equals f of z. Uh, we are basically given a bunch of additional x i's, which are basically f of z i's. So note that f is not changed. It's the same f, but the underlying latent variable is somehow modified. It's intervened on uh, by some 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 someone. So that's what I mean by zi. 
Um, so an example I like to keep in mind is that in robotics, for example, uh, people, uh, some agent explores the environment using different interventions. They may flip the light switch on or off and like you observe the image before and after observations. Uh, it could be paired, could not be paired, but basically you want to learn like what causes uh, these kind of, or controls these kind of like changes. And uh, I'm sure people here are much more aware of this <laughs> than like than me, but I think interventional data data sets are pretty predominant in genomics. Um, and you know you can use that for downstream tasks like drug discovery. So this is like the the uh, overall setting. So I'm going to start with like the punchline of this work, uh, and then I'll go into details. The idea is basically like what Johnny was uh, alluding to. It's like we make the assumption that uh, Z is a linear Gaussian structural causal model, and F is an injective map. Uh, so uh, the injectivity is not a strong assumption because you know it's like a pretty standard assumption people do in machine learning. Uh, the linear Gaussian structural causal model could be uh, restrictive depending on the application you have, but we made the assumption because it still allows for like fairly universal approximation capabilities. Uh, and then the, the other crucial, crucial assumption is that we have single node interventions on all the targets. Um, this is the assumption that, um, I guess it's not in the slide, but yes, uh, I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, and then uh, uh, we assume that, um, under these assumptions, or given these assumptions, we kind of show that we can learn this nonlinear map F and also Z, the, the structural causal uh, uh, graph, um, the latent variables up to some trivial transformations like rotation and similarity transformations, which cannot be avoided. Okay, this is like the summary of uh, this this uh, this this set of this work. Uh, any questions so far? Great. Um, so a quick note on uh, what's been done before. Again, like I think this, this field is kind of booming in the last one year. So there's a lot to like, uh, that's, that's been a lot of work. So apologies if I missed on one of your works or, or some work you like. Um, so the motivation to us was the setting where F is linear uh, and, and it's still the same linear Gaussian structural Gaussian, Gaussian model. Uh, in that case, uh, some prior work uh, by Chandler and his co-authors uh, show that it's actually possible to learn, learn like uh, this kind of like model. So we basically, in, in a sense, generalize this in all, all nonlinear F. And uh, different flavors of, uh, you know, like this problem has also been studied. For example, Z could be nonlinear and F could be still linear. There have been a couple of works on that. And then uh, we look at linear Z and nonlinear F. Um, these two are not exactly compatible. They are like, you know, uh, one could, it's not like we can say one of, some, one of them is strictly better, better than the other. Um, the third kind of works is looking at polym LF and uh, some kind of different kinds of intervention, like do interventions or soft interventions. And uh, we generalize this to like all, all uh, nonlinear F. So other, you know, advantages of our framework uh, are like, you know, having non-paired data or unknown targets and like, you know, allowing a mix of different kinds of interventions. Um, yeah, okay, so let me get into the technical uh, uh, part of the work. Um, so we make a few assumptions. Um, I'm just going to, I already shared the assumptions before and I'm going to just going to like state them in like more, more technicality right now. So the first assumption is that F is nonlinear. Um, this is like the main, uh, you know, driving driving point of our work. And uh, we assume that it's, we make other standard assumptions like it's differentiable and injective and things like that. The second assumption is that uh, the the Z, the latent variables are causal in the, in the linear, linear causal model uh, with Gaussian noise. So mathematically that just means Z equals AZ plus some, some uh, diagonal matrix times the Gaussian noise, N zero I, okay? And, here, uh, A is considered to be a direct acyclic graph. So there's an underlying direct acyclic graph that kind of uh, generates this uh, this uh, Gaussian uh, variable Z, and then that's eventually warped to, to X, the observed data. Um, yeah, I just want to give it, give it a second to make sure that this, this assumption is uh, uh, you know, it's clear because this is the crucial assumption that drives us towards like uh, identifiability. Okay, so we make these two assumptions. And the third assumption is that we assume that interventional data sets are available. Um, by the way, I want you to keep in mind this diagram all the time. It's like you have Zs and you have like Xs. Um, and the third assumption is, is that we have uh, single node interventions on, uh, okay, each intervention is a single node intervention, which means that you cannot, you're not allowed to have inter intervene on two Zis at a single time. Okay, that's that's not allowed in this in this like in the study. Um, so what is like a, what is a single node intervention? A singular intervention basically means uh, you observe xi, which is f of zi, but zi is generated as follows. You basically keep all the equations for z, for z, zj or z, uh, to, to be identical, except for exactly one, which is zti. What do you do to the zti variable? You change the weights to the parents uh, you know, optionally, and also you change the mean and uh, variance of the noise uh, for that variable. 
So you modify the weights of the parents and you change the mean or noise. I mean, invariance of the noise, noise, noise distribution. It should still be Gaussian. You cannot change the you know distribution completely. You just change the mean, the parameters of the Gaussian. Uh, mathematically, it just says that you know your Z i T i is like some mate, some new A i Z i uh, the T i the you know entry plus some some new diagonal matrix times like some shifted uh, Gaussian distribution. So that's what I mean by a single node intervention. Okay. And uh, the fourth and the final assumption, uh, I guess I have um, I have a slide here to like uh, visualize what's going on here because it's, it's like a handful. Um, so the, the leftmost model is the no interventions model, just like the data set you have. You have X, which is like F of Z. The, there are two kinds of interventions I can you can do. They're both single node. So in this diagram, uh, second, the second and third uh, third diagram or third uh, figures are basically showing interventions on the node Z3. Okay, uh, let's start with the third diagram. So it just says that node Z3 uh, is intervened on, and it's a perfect intervention, which means that I basically cut off the difference on the parents. For example, a do intervention is, you know, could be like one of these kinds of interventions. You basically just ignore the parents, forget the, um, you know, dependencies on the parents, and basically change the value or distribution of Z3. That's a, it's a perfect intervention. Sometimes, in some cases, you might have slight dependencies on the parents. You cannot completely get rid of them. In which case, I call it an imperfect intervention. So I, I basically change the weights to the parents, uh, and also like, you know, the noise variable. So Importantly, you cannot add new edges. That's that's not allowed. Uh, it means changing the entire mechanism of like you know how the data is generated, and we don't study that in this work. In fact, I don't even know if uh, it happens in real life. Okay, so the fourth assumption is that again, all nodes are intervened upon. You know, you don't miss out any nodes, and uh, we have uh, thought about that work a little bit, and it seems like it's not as easy as it looks. It, like we need more more assumptions on that um, to make to make that to handle that kind of situations. Okay, so the main theorem is uh, uh, don't don't worry about the large, large line of text. I'm gonna just like quickly summarize this uh, this theorem here. The main theorem is that if you make all these four assumptions and you have perfect interventions, okay, remember perfect means the 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 edges to the parents are completely cut off. If you have these kinds of assumptions and uh, you have perfect interventions, then you can identify the nonlinear TF as well as the causal causal uh, you know uh, latent variables Z up to some sort of simple transformations like permutations and scaling. Okay, and this is like a purely mathematical result. It just says that there's under these under these assumptions, there's a unique model that actually uh, fits all this all this, this all these requirements. Okay, um, are there any questions on like this uh, this claim I'm making? Okay, so this is like the main uh, point of this work to show that. Uh, you can actually, uh, you know, take a very generic generic model, like you know, an arbitrary nonlinear f and like a linear Gaussian like z, and uh, still basically guarantee that there's a unique model that fits the fits the reset. And it's note that I only say it's a mathematical result. It's not clear how to learn this. That will will come to in a bit. But 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 this is the main uh, theorem we want to show uh, in the in the setting. Uh, then we similar to like you know Chandler's work, we kind of look at imperfect interventions also. And then we try to see, hey, okay, like let's say we only have, uh, you know, uh, imperfect intervention. It's not, it's not perfect. Then what can we recover? And we show that, you know, under some assumptions like, you know, none of the interventions is a pure noise intervention. Uh, we can recover the causal order of uh, the the graph. So in some sense, that's like saying uh, we can recover the cause. Uh, what do you call it? Transitive closure of the graph. Um, so yeah, you can still do some recovery in that setting when you don't have like perfect interventions. Um, Okay, so these are the two main uh, theorems we show in this work. And uh, regarding the assumptions, uh, we have a detailed discussion of like what assumptions can be like or probably you know not not important. Uh, for, so for example, example the permutation and scaling assumption cannot be removed because you know you don't observe the ZIs. So I don't know if you're going to output like Z1, Z2, or Z2, Z1 as long as you output the correct, correct causal graph. So that's like not a big deal. Uh, the number of interventions is something I think uh, I have thought about a fair bit. And uh, it turns out that even for linear functions, you cannot improve the number of interventions. Uh, so we probably need like additional data sets or or like some other you know extra information about like the actual causal graph. Um, that is like one one thing. And uh, I guess going beyond Gaussian noise would be actually very cool. And uh, experimentally speaking, uh, we have tested our our ideas on like non-Gaussian noise, uh, and it seems like you know we get reasonable accuracies. But we don't have like a mathematical guarantees of why it's working. It's more like you know proof of concept kind of a thing. Okay, so these are like uh, some quick note on like why the assumptions here are necessary. Yes, those those non Gaussian experiments are those are those non Gaussian noise, but then linear, but for keeping the linearity of the the, the SEM in in latent, or is it 
general no no we we do keep the linearity of the of the scm but we actually try non gaussian noise i see i see okay. yeah uh there have been a couple of other works uh like by varichi and the co-authors and also like uh ibo jiang and his uh, co-authors where uh, uh they tried out non linear z and i believe linear f and they they go to true non linearity not like just like you know some modifications of this uh and uh, they show that it's actually possible to identify like these kind of causal uh, uh you know graphs and even in that setting um i believe that there should be a result of on the horizon like you know non linear z and non linear f but i think the issue there is obviously evaluation like you know what kind of results to play with so that's that's going to be like tricky yeah and then and then so you've looked at the necessity of, of permutation scaling and the number of interventions those i think were both very natural like it seems unlikely with that without external information you're going to need, get less than the interventions if you've got d latents and similarly permutation scaling is just we don't know the units of measurement basically um but 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 the difference between your perfect and imperfect intervention results um do you have a sense on whether the perf the imperfect intervention results is tight like you know is it possible to get to permutation and scaling with imperfect information interventions or or not um i believe that it's not possible even for linear models uh there is should be i mean if i may i may misremember it but there should be an encounter example in like the appendix of uh, chandler's chandler's work uh so yeah in some sense even for imperfect interventions it's still not clear like whether you can actually get uh, up to permutation scaling okay. without additional assumptions thank you okay yeah. but but to me like there's like i mean okay there's some substance in like also trying to figure out if we can get away without mathematical results maybe maybe things work in practice but but then then we lose the point of like you know why are we doing this so yeah it's like a fine balance we need to strike yeah 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 cool right um so here's like a quick proof sketch i believe this is uh, uh was kind of awesome covered like you know uh in like some prior works already so it's not should not be like surprising um we basically look at uh the log odds of like uh different uh, interventions interventional data sets uh with respect to the original data set and we equate them for two different models so the tildes are a separate set of uh, parameters that fit the same data sets and uh, the 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 ones without tilde are like the ones the true parameters and we set the equality of log odds uh, by just looking at uh, because we use gaussian uh, distributions we can get like the the log odds you know exactly i'll i'll show this proof in uh, sketch in like a second um uh, but basically you said the you said the equality of log odds uh, for different parameters and you just stare at this this mathematical you know quadratic expression that you you, you get from from like doing this for every single individual individual set if you really stare at it it looks like a quadratic expression in uh, uh h of z and z okay because okay why is it quadratic because like the the difference of these precision matrices uh, are kind of basically like you know uh quadratic forms and uh, then we start to wonder okay like is if you have this bunch of quadratic equations uh how when can we show that you know how can can we show that h of z is uh, uh linear because that means we are actually learned that's unique h of z that fits the fits the model um and for this we basically is, yes yes so is 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 h here just some arbitrary transformation of z uh, uh h is basically so if you imagine you have two models like uh, one and two and let's say you have f here and uh, f tilde here h is okay. basically f of f tilde inverse okay. so you okay. go yeah, from yeah, z yeah. to x then you go back to like z tilde using like this is the entire yeah, composition yeah. is called h yeah okay good good so yeah you have this sort of like bunch of quadratic quadratic equations and uh, you want to you uh, prove that h is linear uh, in, in that case you mean you have learned like to invert the true f somehow uh, oh yes go ahead sorry i mean danya sorry i was i thought you were raising yeah, your hand sorry. yeah yeah i was um sorry um this is uh, maybe a bit naive but i mean don't we want to argue that h of z is not just linear but actually up to permutation and scaling um it it will follow as a subsequent uh, uh in a subsequent argument but yes once you learn h up to linearity you can basically resort to like chandler's work and they say okay because they already handled the linear case um uh, so yeah we 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 can do that or you can do it from scratch it's, it's fine okay. that's right so the first the most difficult step is obviously like the main contribution of our work is say h is linear uh after that it's like prior work um right so 
for this, we basically use the fact that the graph is causal and has a direct acyclic structure. So if you look at the root nodes, the difference of these position matrices has rank one. And uh, you can kind of tell by looking at which of these uh, entries are rank one that these nodes have to be like, uh, like, um, like, like root nodes. So in some sense, you can inductively go from the root uh, downwards uh, by an extra, and prove that uh, H is linear, like entry by entry. That's the rough uh, sketch of the proof for how we handle like nonlinearity. So the tricky part is just to like write down the log odds and equate them. And after that is just some, some analysis. Okay, so this is the sketch of the proof. Um, and uh, now like I'm gonna talk about the experimental uh, part of this, uh, this talk, uh, that's the final part. Um, are there any questions so far about like, you know, the theory and like assumptions, things like that? Okay, so yeah, we can have more discussions after the talk. So basically I'm gonna give a, 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 you know, like a summary of the experimental uh, things we tried out in this work. Um, so as people here probably know, like the most useful approach is, you know, to take a VAE based approach. So what you do is uh, you basically, you know, try to model, uh, have an encoder that maps the observed X to some, some unlatent variable Z. And then you have a decoder that maps it back. And then you try to uh, learn this jointly uh, by, by, by uh, optimizing some, some sort of evidence lower bound loss. And this is basically the VAE approach. And, it's, and I think like almost 95% of the papers I've read in like uh, cause recognition learning or uh, use some sort of variant of this idea. Um, so there is some difficulty here because we don't know the intervention targets. So it's not easy here, easy like to, to just like close your eyes and use VAEs. But people, I think, uh, Jiachi Zhang's work like from last year also like, you know, they train a new model to like learn uh, this kind of like uh, intervention targets. And I think they made it work to reasonable success. Um, but this is the usual approach. So we basically were trying to see if we can come up with something different just to, you know, add to the area of techniques available. And we, you know, use a very simple idea, use, use a lot in like machine learning, which is basically contextual learning. So the idea is very simple. You just want to train a, a network to distinguish. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you a sample. And it's a job to tell me if it's coming from the observational data set X0 or an international data set X1, XI. That's it. Like, just train a model. I don't care about reconstruction or elbow loss or anything like that. And this is like a very simple uh, idea that I guess goes back 30, 40 years probably at this point. Um, oops. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, basically, like, this is the uh, uh, entire uh, idea of contrast learning in this in this work. We basically want to distinguish uh, observational samples from international samples. And uh, the main... Uh, part where you, uh, you know, change the architecture is to the, it's in the last layer. So you use like whatever deep neural network, whatever deep network you want for the nonlinear F, but the last layer must model uh, the Gaussian log density. And, and to do that, we basically like, you know, pick the last layer to be a quadratic function of whatever the nonlinearity outputs. And uh, why is this, why does this make sense? Okay, we don't have any theoretical guarantees on like why this is always gonna, uh, whether this is always gonna work, but this makes sense because the best possible classifier for two Gaussian distributions is basically like uh, the optimal base classifier. And if you compute it by hand, it's basically a quadratic expression. In fact, that was used in the proof like of, of our idea. So basically that means that you choose the last layer to be a to model a Gaussian log density and uh, just train your model to distinguish like, you know, these, these samples and uh, hope for the best. Um, so yeah, uh, just to like, you know, in more technical detail of what I meant uh, by log odds, uh, if you, compute by hand, like mathematically, like the log odds of a sample coming from an international data set over like an observation data set, it looks like this quadratic data set, a quadratic function uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, outputs of this like nonlinearity. Okay. It's just a quadratic, quadratic in uh, f inverse of x and the coefficients are coming from, uh, you know, like this underlying parameters. And you also have like a, like a quadratic inner product with like some, some row of the, the underlying causal matter, causal graph. Um, Remember, we don't know any of these parameters. We just want to learn them. So just close your eyes and like, you know, call them as parameters to your model. So this is the last layer basically looks like a quadratic expression. And just just train this model like, you know, end to end. And uh, if, if like, you know, if things, you know, work perfectly, uh, then we should have learned to invert the map F. And this is the main uh, idea behind contextual learning. And the other... Technical details are actually very sim similar to like, you know, what people do in practice. You know, you just, you just like uh, have a simple cross entropy loss. You average it over like all sets. You add like a uh, node tiers uh, loss function. This function basically tries to push the graph learned towards like a, like a, like a direct acyclic graph. And then you have like a simple, like, you know, L1 regularizer. So this is the entire loss function. And uh, we just train our model end to end. 
Okay, any questions on the uh, experimental methodology before I go to like uh, some metrics? Okay, so I'm gonna just show some some results of some experiments. Um, I want to like uh, emphasize that these experiments are not large scale; they are like very small scale and control and, and, and done in a very controlled uh, setting. So there's obviously future work to like you know like scale this up. Um, so for for linear f, uh, basically like you know we we sample the DAG and like you know f randomly. Uh, and this is synthetic tested. So we we sample them randomly and we we basically like assign the targets arbitrarily and uh, we only have the results. Uh, and then see how our model con uh, works with uh, the linear baseline, um, which is which I believe is linear algebraic. Um, and then we we kind of report uh, like four kinds of metrics. One is the structural Hamming distance of the graph that's learned, so lower is better. And uh, the AURC, MCC, and R square metrics are also reported. So MCC kind of measures how well the latent variables have been recovered, and uh, R square and AURC measure also measure like you know some some sort of like how how well uh, you know like these are are learned linearly. Um, and we try like five variables, five uh, sorry, latent variables and ten observed variables on linear models, um, and and we we seem to like beat like the linear baseline. Um, and then we also try like non-linear okay. f. Yes. Why would we beat the non the linear baseline given that f is linear? Do you have an intuition for this? What is, what well, maybe maybe differently? What is what is the linear baseline? But <laughs> yeah. The linear baseline is the work uh, uh, in like uh, sorry, this algorithm proposed in uh, Chandler's paper, uh, yep. and uh, I believe they do some sort of like linear algebraic like you know uh, computations. Yeah, do I can have a sense of jump in. Go for it, it's, Chandler. It's very much, it's like a constraint based method and totally not optimized for being good with sample efficiency. Um, basically, directly adapted uh, from see, the see, proofs. See. Okay. Okay. So it's it's plausible that like in finite samples, the contrastive methods just tend to work better than the constraint based methods. And sort of the analogous to score based methods using constraint based methods in finite samples. Yeah, that's possible, but I'm not going to like claim that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, it's nice that okay. the author is here to clarify. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, and then we basically tried uh, non-linear f. So here we don't have the linear baseline. Um, we can still try the linear baseline and hope that it works. But yeah, we, we cannot like you know technically apply it. Uh, and then here we also uh, contrasted the VA approach where we do know the intervention targets. We give it as extra information, and it seems like the contrastive method still outputs like very good SSG uh, uh, scores and like you know other 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 metrics, MCC metrics, uh, compared to the other baselines for like a array of different uh, synthetic settings, like you know five variables. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, five variables and like an average degree two, 10 variables average degree two, and like you know, number of observed variables can be as large as 100. So this is like promising that, you know, for synthetic deserts, um, you can actually get like really good uh, metrics. Um, so we went on to try like, you know, image data um, to see like, you know, if these things uh, hold for like more realistic looking datasets. So the image data sets that we basically study is like, a uh, simple like you know a uh, uh, rendering of like some images of balls this is basically this was basically done in like some prior work i think by Kathy Hauja and his co-authors um where they uh, yeah they used like this pi package called pi game but, okay so the idea is that you're basically given coordinates of different balls in an image 2d image and you basically draw a simple you know 2d image so showing the balls and this is your observed data like uh, x is basically the image of uh, uh, the balls and uh, what is a Z? A Z is the coordinates of the balls, the 2D coordinates of the balls. And uh, they are generated as per like some underlying Gaussian graph uh, that you actually hand construct. So you basically like uh, construct the Z, the coordinates using this DAG, and then you do this complicated image rendering and you get the image as actual input. And uh, what do we do here? So we basically take the image as input. And then for the nonlinearity, we use like conditional linear networks. Uh, to distill like you know the the some sort of like low dimensional representation of these images, and then we use the the, the contrastive learning approach to like uh, do con contrast uh, between interventional and, and uh, uh, observational observational data sets. So in the in this setting also like we noticed that uh, you know we tried like two or three balls. I believe we also did like reported some some ten balls or something in the paper. Um, that the the contrastive method seems to uh, you know slightly beat like the VA based approach. So, so that's like uh, it's promising that you know, like uh, this this ideas might actually work uh, in 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 uh, um, you know more generality if if like you know we have like better models and things like that. Okay, so that's basically like uh, the summary of the experimental work. 
uh, I'm going to conclude like the talk and then, you know, we can have an extra discussion of like how to improve these kinds of uh, ideas. Um, so in this work, basically like we looked at uh, Gaussian uh, prior, uh, you know, for, for Z. And then we looked at uh, nonlinear F. This is like one of the main, uh, you know, motivation, a uh, main like contributions of our work, uh, as opposed to like you know linear, linear or polynomial and things like that. And we have again like single node interventions on every single node, um, and we want to learn the entire cause, cause the entire model, including nonlinearities. And this is the goal of causal representation learning. We see, we show that it's possible uh, under these assumptions. Um, and then uh, the ideas are very similar to like what's been done in prior works. So it's not mathematically very involved, but it's more about the message that it's actually possible to do this. And uh, for the learning algorithm, um, BAEs are still like a very important player in the game uh, for, for this problem. But we just wanted to have, see how well contextual learning can do this. Mostly because contextual learning has like a lot of, uh, you know, good support, like in terms of other, other domains. And uh, it turns out that actually uh, it, it does seem to do really well on like some simple synthetic assets and like some very semi-synthetic image assets. So, the obvious questions are whether like, you know, we can scale this contrast algorithm to much more logical assets. Uh, and I guess uh, of more interest to, to this this group, I think we want to see if we can uh, apply these ideas to like, you know, uh, genomics assets and like, you know, maybe we figure out like, you know, different kinds of causal factors of going like uh, these kind of assets. And again, as far as uh, technical contributions of uh, future work goes, we can look at nonlinear Z and, uh, you know, nonlinear Z and nonlinear F. Uh, that might also be interesting, and we can also look at like multi-node interventions or sublinear number of inter sublinear number of interventions and see if uh, uh, these these can these in these things we can actually learn the causal graph end to end. Um, that's that's pretty much what I have today. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Thank you, Gautam. The VAE baseline that you were looking at there were were those just um, just like better VAE or is that was that a a disentanglement method? Uh, I think it was like uh beta V. Yes, it was beta V. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Have you looked at how this compares to things like? Like Kartik's work with with Yixing, um the 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 interventional false representation learning um, paper that they had. Uh, I believe that they do they use do interventions. Uh, yeah. so we are not sure how to apply their uh, algorithm at all because mm -hmm. we have like the assets, mm -hmm. and um, I yeah, yeah, yeah. think they also have polynomial uh, f where you need to give in the degree of the polynomial. So th there are some technical complications. Yeah. Stuff. There, yeah. Yeah, you can get away with the you can get away from the polynomial assumption if you do a lot of do interventions, but you're right that the do interventions but then there's a sort of mismatch. You guys only need D interventions, they need a lot of interventions. They they have a sort of they have like a covering argument um for right for, for getting away from that. Yeah, I believe um, they had like a lot of do interventions on a single node, uh not just one. Yeah. And it was not yeah, clear yeah, how to exactly. even do that. Yeah, use that for our, our setting. Yeah. yeah. And I think if I remember correctly, the degree there was prohibitively large. What was it? Oh yeah, yeah. I guess uh, if you want, you know, any nonlinear F, you know, using that that technique, the degree would have to be insanely large. And it was not mm -hmm. like you know practical. We have other questions. I have a comment. Oh, mm -hmm. actually, here, jo Johnny has a question. So let's let's uh, have Johnny go first. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I think I guess it's also more of a discussion point. But one one of one of the things that you get from uh, sort of using linear algebraic methods, like the uh, uh, like I guess with with the polynomial generators. Um, that we saw in our last talk was you can sort of figure out how many dimensions there are in the latent space without having to uh, do this. Like it leaves a signature in terms of in, ter in, in terms of the dimension because you're sort of mapping um, like you're, you're yeah you're mapping with something that's sort of almost linear. So you can um, and one of the nice 
things there is, is you can sort of like collapse interventions onto onto each other. So you could sort of identify, for example, gene programs, um, interventions that sort of belong to the same program or that might target sort of the same dimension. Um, I'm wondering if there's if you think there's any path towards this with fully nonlinear generators. Let's say if we use this Gaussian assumption as well. So if I understand right, you're asking whether it's possible to learn like the number of Zs from like just observational data sets. Like that's yeah. a dimension of like the latent variable. Uh, yeah. This was a good question. Actually, was, I think it was brought up by one of the recruiter, uh, reviewers as well. Um, and I think for, for that, we basically, okay, first of all, it's identifiable uh, just because, you know, like oh, for simple dimension reasons. Uh, and for, in practice, I believe we use some estimators for like learning the dimension of the manifold. So because you assume that F is injective and differentiable and embeds into like some, some sort of like low dimensional uh, subspace, uh, you can use some sort of simple heuristics to, uh, to recover the dimension of like Z. Uh, I believe it was some estimator that kind of looks at uh, volumes of small balls and see how, how fast they grow like in, in some small domain. Uh, this is from some 2005 work on like some estimators of like, you know, manifold dimensions. Um, these seem to work reasonably well. Uh, for like our, our data sets, synthetic data sets as well as image data sets. And, and yeah, also, they're also identifiable because of like simple, simple like algebraic reasons. So that's one way you can actually learn the uh, dimension of the underlying uh, Z variables. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm I, we, we, we actually thought about trying some sort of data sets like, you know, from, from genomics, like, you know, like, like you guys do, but um, I think we didn't have the domain knowledge for it. And uh, also it's not clear how to evaluate uh, these kind of predictions without like, you know, understanding what we are looking at. Right. So that's always like <laughs> a, a big question here. Yeah. The testability is so it's gonna be almost not possible. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost not possible. Do, do you know how they are like, what's the right way to test it? Like, do you just, assume it's correct and like go ahead and like see if using some physical experiments whether these things can work or uh, what's the what's the non non with not scientific way of testing these things uh i guess even experimentation won't necessarily work because it's like we still don't know the latents and i mean at most you can like everything can match observational data equally well and i mean to even talk about identifiability you started at the, you started at the point where observation matches equally well I guess, um, I guess you can s try to make predictions using your learned latent variable model and then see if that matches some, some experimentation, but I don't know if that actually gives you anything about whether or not you've learned the correct latents, just that you've learned the correct observational model again. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's effectively kind of downstream tasks as a function of the latents um, that can only be correct if you get the correct latents. It seems like the, 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 the only way that you're going to make that work. Um, like, right. how do we do this in science, right? We, 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 we draw inferences about what, what must be going on um and then design experiments that test kind of the implications of that it's there's telepaths of different theories um which is a sort of which is an analogous to that um well just i think i think one thing that you could try to do is if you have sort of multiple sort of if you have like some sort of side data that you don't that that you don't introduce in training the model uh, I guess that's that's sort of a um, that's sort of what what you're saying, like like with a with a task, like say you have an additional thing that you assume is a, is the out is is the output of a task, like a response variable or something like that, uh, and you don't let the model see that, but you assume it's somehow related to your latents or related to your data through the latents, um, or you can like I guess just try learning it again on something similar. And seeing how seeing how how the results compare, but that's got a lot of like, like I guess if your model if you assume is like smooth enough, then a small distribution shift should preserve roughly what what your latents are learned if it's identifiable, uh, or if you have data from different modalities that that sort of represent the same 
the same underlying process and see if they they learn the same thing. Um, these are all sort of things that we thought about. <laughs> do, do you think like uh, you know, okay, so maybe two part question, but like, is linearity a reasonable assumption in these uh, applications? Or uh, I know Gaussianity is not a good assumption, but what about linearity? Not 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 good. Okay. <laughs> I see. So, so we so actually, I, I, I mean, to, I wanted to jump in about this because actually I was thinking the comment that I wanted to make earlier is the linearity thing actually reminds me a lot of something that we sometimes do with deep learning, where we say that there's some task, let's say that you want to do downstream and you have some complex inputs. We are sometimes looking specifically for some features that we can extract from the inputs such that the prediction is, is linear. So we don't quite know, like, it's sort of like doing basis regression or something, right? Um, we want to figure out what it is that will allow us to have linear predictive power over some, some label of interest. Um, the thing is, though, is that that kind of information isn't necessarily going to be maybe human interpretable. So what's kind of interesting in your case is I, I don't think that's actually the linear assumption we didn't, I didn't find as unpalatable. Um, because you could argue you're doing the same kind of thing. You're trying to discover the kinds of Zs such that you can have linear explanations between the different Zs. The thing is, though, I think it's questionable whether this kind of Z would correspond to really, really nice aspects of images like color and shape that we, where we love telling stories about. It may actually be very complicated and uninterpretable for a human. Um, but this is actually, uh, my understanding is that also in neuroscience, there's a lot of really interesting work on this kind of linear um, inductive bias because there's a lot of reason to think that maybe the brain also wants to encode information in such a way that um, you can have the ability to predict linearly. So yeah, I don't know. I think the linear um, assumption is interesting in what it implies about the kind of Zs you expect to extract. So it's a really good point. I think I want to add one more thing to that is one thing I'm, I mean, that's the kind of, you know, motivation I also have for learning uh, linear Z, you know, you want to understand if you can actually learn some Z such that some human interpretive concepts are linearly related to like, you know, what you have learned uh, or, or like, you know, some, some features are linearly related to like the representations you learn. But one, I guess, philosophical point about this kind of causal representation learning lines kinds of work is that you don't just want to learn like good linear representations, but you also want to learn the true generative rep representations, which may or may not be linear. So for example, uh, if you look at image assets, there's no reason why uh, you know the, the generative representations are like color and shape. So in some sense, there's like a crossroads. Right? Do you want to learn the true generative factors or do you just want to like some useful factors? So that's an additional, additional point I want to add to that. Maybe one 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 final thought is I think it's pretty important. I think it's going to be important for us going forward to figure out uh, what happens in the case of model misspecification, um, because I think I think in in very in like linear ICA, I'm pretty sure even if you get this somehow if, even if you get I think the distribution wrong, you can still recover the the ground truth latents. Uh, if it satisfies some additional assumptions so it's like that's sort of what happens under model misspecification um and i wonder if there's sort of any any guarantees that we can figure yeah, out yeah uh we ran uh results i'm sorry experiments on like non-gaussian uh you know uh noise variables uh we should, it's, it's still linear but it's non-gaussian i think we tried like uniform distribution laplace distribution and things like that uh it should be in like the uh updated updated paper um, and we saw that the kind of performance is, is degrading, but not like by a lot. It's, it's like running, uh, you know, uh, algorithms to learn Gaussian causal graphs on like non-Gaussian, uh, you know, causal graphs, just it, it degrades, but not by a significant amount. And we kind of noticed like the similar kinds of performance, even for, for our model. This is a bit surprising because, you know, like this, I thought there was, there were a lot of moving parts here and like the Gaussianity was so crucial. Um, but you still use like a quadratic final layer and it still re does reasonably well. So that was surprising to us. Um, but we admit that mathematically proving that these things are identifiable is going to be like a lot of work. Um, looking at, you know, the same kind of ideas, like log arts of like some, some uniform distribution, it's not going to be easy. Um, so yeah, uh, I believe that there's like, uh, fruit in like exploring non-Gaussian uh, latent variables, but 
um, it, it remains to be seen whether it's actually going to be like significantly better. I guess I guess my point is whether or not you can attack this from from the angle of you fit it with a Gaussian model and you still have access to all those quadratic terms, but the true data generating distribution comes from an exponential family, uh, and under that, like under those circumstances, whether or not you can prove that there's still some sort of identifiability or not identifiability per se, but the ability to recover those ground truth factors. Um, I don't know. This is just good point. That random idea. Uh, I I actually honestly believe it's possible to prove identity in those settings. Uh, just that we have to use very different ideas, not the same techniques. Yeah, yeah. And it's possible some very crazy assumption might just show up out of nowhere. There's a question about causal normalizing flows, which deals with none in the in the chat. I don't know if you have a comment on that. <laughs> um, I don't think I've read this work. It's is it recent or there's two of these. There's one called causal component analysis and one called causal normalizing flows. And uh, uh, I don't know which one I, I believe the causal component analysis paper, I, I remember skimming it briefly, and I believe it assumes the graph is known. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a big a big assumption in my mind, at least for these kind of applications. Uh, I'm not sure of the other work. Thanks for the Moreover, so just, just because I talked about this yesterday in class, um, to add to the confusion, there's there's causal normalizing flows that was a bit older, um, and they propose a, you know deep learning methods to do some counterfactual inference, um, but there was no theory there. Uh, and then there's a recent paper about the same kind of thing, um, but they focus more on giving some identifiability guarantees and in between the two, there's also causal, causal auto regressive flows. So um, there's a lot of work on that particular topic. I think I think I can I can speak to causal normalizing flows. The one the one that was just posted in the in the chat because of this uses my favorite um, triangular monotonic maps. Um, it, it's it's just it's not necessarily trying to do representation learning because it's sort of assuming the same dimensionality. Um, uh, it's basically just saying, you know, you're still learning a generative model because, but, but you're learning them from the noise variables of an SCM to, to the, um, to the observed variables. And then because this model is, is, is identifiable, you can always, you can sort of always recover the noise variables up to a component wise transformation. Uh, and then because of that, you can do this sort of like causal abduction step and uh, infer the, in, by inferring the the latent, the noise variables, you can do counterfactual inference. Um, well, that's sort of how you do counterfactual inference in SCN, where you try to infer the noise variables and then, um, and, and, and then you push it through the learned system. Um, so I'm not actually too sure that it's relevant to to uh, this type of thing. I suppose it's something you could actually do in the latent space um, after you learn something up to, I don't know, a linear identification or something like that. 